Our guest lecturer today, retired U.S. Army Brigadier General, and now an adjunct professor teaching in our undergraduate program in Holocaust and Genocide Studies, is Richard O'Meara. The Richard Stockton College is really pleased to have Professor O'Meara be with us today, and he'll begin our 2007-2008 lecture series with what I know will be a thoughtful, provocative, and informed lecture on a topic that should be of immediate interest to all of us, Darfur. Should we use the G word, genocide, when we think about, discuss, or teach about Darfur? Is Darfur a genocide? That is the question on our agenda today, and not just our question, but it is America's question. It is the European Union's question. It is the United Nations question. Is Darfur a genocide? What we do know is that what is going on in Darfur is one of the pressing issues facing genocide scholars, humanitarian workers, politicians, and even military personnel today. It is a crisis that erupted in early 2003 and continues today even as I speak and as you sit here in this classroom. It is a crisis in which the government of Sudan troops and the Janjaweed, the Arab militia, are responsible for the mass murder of literally thousands and thousands of black Africans, primarily from the Fur, Zahawa, and the Masali tribal groups, and, poss and possibly several hundreds of thousands of others as a result of de depriving them and depriving more than two million internally displaced persons of adequate food, water, shelter, and medical care. Is Darfur a genocide? That is the question. It is certainly, in Elie Wiesel's words, today's world capital of human pain suffering and agony. Do we not have some obligation as human beings to do something to relieve that pain, to try to stop that suffering, to hold accountable in an international tribunal those who are responsible for inflicting these horrors on our fellow human beings? Or is our responsible abrogated because we don't know what to do? I do not know if Richard O'Meara can answer any or all of these questions, but what I do know is that this retired military officer, this international lawyer who has journeyed to many of the areas of the world where conflict and horror hold sway or held sway, thinks about such issues, and none more than whether or not Darfur is a genocide. I'm pleased to welcome Professor Richard O'Meara to share his insights and questions with us. Professor O'Meara. Thank you. Let me uh, make a couple apologies before I get started. Always a good thing to do. First of all, I've got a massive cold. I've been honking for a week, so I'll be honking at you for the next 20 minutes to half an hour. Uh, sorry, <laughs> but I, I did get out of bed this morning and I am here, so that's good. I think I'm on the, on the, the right end of this cold at this point. Second is I've, I've been playing around with technology here, which is always a bad thing for me to do personally. So we'll see whether we have any problems with regard to some of the things that I, uh, that I hope to put up here. Uh, hopefully it won't mess up the presentation too much. Let me get a sense of who's in the room. Uh, do we have uh, anybody who has been involved as an NGO or a participant in Darfur First or, or any of those organizations that are on college campuses these days? Sorry? No. Yeah, well, it's, that's one of them, sure. Uh, nobody, okay. Uh, are you all in the master's program, aside from the faculty? Are you all in the master's program here? No. You just wandered in here? You're kidding. Forced to be here. Oh, okay. Uh, so you've been graduates of the master's program? So you are many of your teachers, I take it? No. No teachers? Couple teachers? Good, yeah. 
Uh, great. Um, when I talk about Darfur, and the reason I, I'm checking this is because very often many people know more about Darfur than I do. So I want to make sure that I don't step on myself early. I want to know who's in the room. Okay? It's always a good thing for a teacher to know that, right? Uh, my, my subject here really isn't specifically Darfur, right? Another, in a sense, an apology. My subject is, is it a genocide? So I'm using Darfur as a tool to get to the discussion, which I hope we will have at the end, uh, is it a genocide? And, and I've become, I was telling Carol, uh, over the last couple of years, probably as a function of age, a real contrarian. I mean, I'll always take the opposite side of pretty much any position. I, I uh, and being an attorney, I also take the position that probably there's not a genocide going on in Darfur, at least from what I, uh, and that to my mind, my lawyer's mind specifically, it makes a difference what we call it. Okay? I was at uh, uh, the Association for Genocide Scholars, with Steve Jacobs actually, last summer in Srebrenica or in Sarajevo, and uh, presented a paper there on tribunals. And there was another couple lawyers there uh, who, uh, and, as, and I looked around for the whole week, those were the only two panels, the ones that we did on tribunals and, the, and this other panel uh, that dealt with a specific case. And I, when I got off the, uh, when, and when the attorney, Dutch attorney, who had been involved in a particular case and hadn't won the entire case, uh, when he got off the dais, I asked him, "Am I missing the point here? Or these people hate you for a reason?" You know. And the reality was, I mean, you could feel the tension in the room, scholars and lawyers. There was. You know, you, why can't you lawyers, we know this is a genocide, why can't you deal with it, okay? And the lawyer was looking and said, well, you know, there's a law, it's a very specific drill. It's a very, it's a very uh, constrained environment, only certain evidence goes in there, you have to prove certain things, and if you don't, justice isn't done, truth isn't, isn't found, and indeed, there's no genocide, okay? Uh, that's the vehicle within which we play. And I've tried cases for many, many years, and it's, it's a very small world. Scholars just couldn't get that. Lawyers think different, obviously, than, than scholars do, as a rule, okay? Uh, and he said, no, I can't. He walked out in disgust. He, he, he was tired, you know, he just couldn't do it. That it was a real disconnect, massive disconnect at that conference between the genocide piece from a lawyer's point of view and the genocide piece from a scholar's point of view. That's kind of what I'm going to be talking about here, and that's really my teaching point for the day. And I suppose the discussion ought to be, and what you ought to leave and have the discussion about is, does it make any difference? You know, we have this disconnect. What's the purpose of concerning ourselves with the solemnity of the word? Does it make a difference? I, I think it does. I take the position that. Uh, um, but then I'm with uh, Raphael Lemkin on this, and he's a lawyer, you know. So he says, you use the word for very specific things and only for those things, and then uh, it has meaning, carries meaning. That's kind of the argument. There are other and very well articulated arguments on the opposite of that, obviously. Okay. So having said all that, let me just uh, get back into. <coughs> Uh, the presentation here. First of all, uh, let me begin again by introducing myself. I come from uh, a number of different perspectives with regard to this issue, and I always tell people where I come from because uh, in the law specifically, we're very much interested in opinions, but only those opinions that have weight to them, gravity, gravitas, whatever. Uh, so that we check, uh, a judge will tell a jury very often, you can listen to this individual's opinion, or you don't have to listen to it at all if you don't want to. And, and these are the things you should consider when you listen to this opinion. First of all, whether the individual is qualified to give the opinion, gone to school, whatever. And secondly, whether or not he or she's done his homework. They actually studied the documents, looked into things. Right? And if you find that, for example, a doctor is giving an opinion in a court case about uh, how to run a store, well, probably not qualified. Nice education, not for the opinion he wants to give, right? 
or that the doctor's giving the opinion about a medical case, but he didn't read the records. Well, didn't do his homework. So throw that opinion out. So I like to find out when I, when I listen to people where they're coming from, and I do that by kind of giving, sharing a little bit of my own background. <coughs> so again, as Carol said, I'm a retired military officer, 35 years bouncing around the world in various places. I'm also a retired trial attorney. I uh, had a law firm for a number of years. My academic training is in history and international relations. And ultimately, I tend to look at things from the point of view of a lawyer, if you haven't figured that out by now, okay? Which is, frankly, fairly, as my wife tells me, a fairly strange way to think about things. But, but uh, it is a little bit different, okay? Uh, while I've, I haven't been to Sudan, personally, not yet anyway, I have spent time in Chad and uh, Kenya, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, Cambodia, El Salvador, Bosnia, Iraq, and Vietnam, amongst other countries. And most of the time that I was in those countries, I was working uh, generally in military uniform, but I was working pretty much for the State Department as an attorney, either teaching or putting together institutions that were broke as a result of one of the traumas that had occurred in one of these places, okay? It's been pretty interesting work. My sense is that what is occurring in Darfur probably does not fall within the useful definition of genocide. My argument is that no matter how horrendous the violence, arguing over whether a genocide has occurred is simply not helpful. Professor Raphael Lemkin's dream that the mere uttering of the word would mobilize the international community to action simply is not materialized. The realist in me is informed by the fact that states intervene in the activities of other states over issues of power and prestige, not over issues of justice. The idealist in me, frankly, is not concerned about a legal formulation that rates the conduct of states according to the stated intention of the mass murderers as they go about disappearing people and populations. I prefer the term, personally, crimes against humanity. It speaks to the victim of the crime, all of humanity and it speaks to those who are responsible to do something about it. Not necessarily nation states as part of treaty obligations, and that's what the Genocide Convention is, a treaty, but rather each member of the human race has a responsibility to deal with the genocide, crime against humanity. Right? And yet there is something compelling about the genocide formulation, Samantha Power, Samantha Power, you may have read her book, uh, a Problem from Hell remembers the extraordinary efforts of Lemkin to create a legal standard to once and for all end the crime with no name. There is something particularly dangerous about the ability of a man or men to harness the power of the modern state in the project of mass murder. Industrialized killing, Omer Bartov has called it, impersonal yet efficient in the extreme. Lemkin's faith was in the law. The ability of rules, even international rules, to determine the crime, to deter the crime. Hannah Arendt's mock explanation to Adolf Eichmann regarding the justification for his death rings true. And yet there's something about it that is extra legal, not really legal. And I quote her, and just as you supported and carried out a policy of not wanting to share the earth with the Jewish people and the people of a number of other nations, as though you and your superiors had any right to determine who should and who should not inhabit the world, we find that no one, that is, no member of the human race, can be expected to want to share the earth with you. This is the reason and the only reason you must hang. In order to consider the question of genocide more specifically, let me take some time to review the tragedy which is occurring today in the west of Sudan, Darfur. No one can disagree that the violence is horrendous, once again, a state government attempting to break the economic, social, and political will of a minority through the infliction of pain and terror. I have some slides which I would like to show you as we go over the facts. Let me say before we get started that I'm very sensitive to the commoditization of these people's suffering. John Lennon and Malcolm Foley call it dark tourism the commodification of death and disaster, and surely that is so. The internet provides the information. We invade the privacy of these poor suffering people and splay it 
display their worst moments across our discussions like so much confetti. Yet I'm not aware of any other way to have a serious conversation about a serious subject without at least recognizing the reality of the subject. Real people, real kids, real death, real destruction. First, the map. Sudan is, I, I went to the CIA fact book and got a bunch of facts with regard to this place because I was going to ask the question, uh, which is what do you see when you look at that map and these various pictures? And what m many of you will say is I see injustice, I see pain, I see horror, I see agony. And, and the human rights guy in me, social justice guy in me sees those things as well. But what I also see, the military guy in me, sees a nightmare in terms of doing peacekeeping. So you've got to look at the map. What does the map show me? There is no friendly country to move troops into. Where do you go? You set up in Libya? Set up in Egypt? Uh, maybe, but probably not. I've been to Chad. I've actually trained with the French Foreign Legion in Chad. The French Foreign Legion's in Chad. Uh, theory, you could go to Chad. Chad's got its own problems. And having said that, Chad's a tough place to set up anyway. There's no water there either. Okay. Congo, certainly no good. Ethiopia, no good. And what I mean by set up, I mean taking a bunch of soldiers, putting them in a particular place, for a long period of time, making sure they have refrigeration and food and mail and all the stuff you need to do. And moving, moving oil and gas and all the stuff to move those vehicles and then getting a, a, an air force together, a bunch of helicopters, to fly in and out of Darfur so that can, stuff can be used, right? Massive undertaking. If you don't like Halliburton because of Iraq, they're the only people qualified to do this job. So what you would do is you would hire Halliburton to do this at zillions of dollars. Zillions. And they'll, they'll do it. They'll set up anywhere for you. If you pay them enough money, they've got the people. This isn't something we say, oh, we'll send the peacekeepers. This is a nightmare. And indeed, what occurs when you send 10, 15,000 young men to uh, a sub-Saharan country for six months to a year. You think those young men are going to be looking for young women? You think any of those young men are going to wind up with AIDS as a result of hanging out in one of these countries? You think their moms and dads are going to be real happy that you sent them there? Okay. Or you can keep them on campus, keep them on post, lock them down, no alcohol, no women. And then you've got a revolt in your hands. right? There are a million reasons why you don't want to do peacekeeping in Darfur, why the French don't want to do it. I mean, nobody wants to do it. Certainly not a Western country. And I'm not saying don't do it, but it ain't easy, is my point. And the map tells us that. Okay? <coughs> Sudan is an Arabic country. Apparently it means country of blacks. It's the largest African and Arab country by area in the world. It is situated at a crossroads between the Horn of Africa and the Middle East, okay, and also between Saharan Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. So there's a lot of tension, traditional tension, hundreds of years of tension. Okay? It is bordered by Egypt to the north, the Red Sea to the northeast, Eritrea and Ethiopia to the east, Kenya and Uganda to the southeast, Democratic Republic of the Congo and the Central African Republic to the southwest. Chad to the west and Libya to the northeast. It is the 10th largest country in the world. Important, big, okay? The geography is, in most parts of Sudan, unforgiving. Again, problems with peacekeeping also causes that tension, which may have something to do with what's going on there violent, in terms of the violence, right? The north, home to approximately 22 million Arab-speaking Sudanese, is the most prosperous. Okay? Connected as it is to the Nile River, major cities, and a lot of oil, okay? which is now being mined, <coughs> taken out of the ground, and refined and sent. 80% of it goes to China. China is the great mentor of the Sudanese government. Okay? 
The South, excuse me, is predominantly rural and has a population of around 6 million. Sudanese, who are predominantly non-Muslim and non-Arab speaking. The West, essentially Darfur, uh, has a population which has been variously estimated as between 6 and 7 million. Nobody's really sure. People divided roughly between pastoralists and farmers, which again is the other issue. I mean, there's about, I teach a course in nationalism and ethnic conflict. And, and, and one of the points that I make is everybody's got ethnicity in their heads. We've all got our tribe in the back of our minds. Primordialists, sociologists say we've all were born with it, we've got it. Question is, when you put pressure on those, uh, then those primordial instincts come out. Tom Friedman calls it the Lexus and the olive tree, and, and, and people start swinging, throwing hands, right? When you put pressure. Well, there's about 18 kinds of pressure. And what we study in the course is all the different pressures that exist in various places. Well, th this place has got it all. It's got every one. It's got ethnic stuff, certainly. It's got a classic. Uh, the one that I find personally, intellectually, the most fascinating is the, is the, the pastoralist uh, farmer issue. It's something that runs through American history. You guys watch a Western recently? What do you have? You have the cowboys. Right? And they're the guys who are on the range, and they're freedom-loving desperados, right? And they no, no fence me in, no walls, no, no, uh, no fences, right? And they, they just, they range on the range, right? And then you have the civilization, the civilized guys, right? They're the farmers. And they come and they build the towns and they bring their women. Next thing you know, they're setting up a church and they're, and they're, and they're uh, shutting down the bars and they hire a sheriff, right? And all Westerns are about that, that, that battle between those two groups. William McNeil, a historian, calls it, uh, I mean, that's, that's where the tension and friction between the barbarians, if you will, and the, and the people in, in town, that's where civilization comes from, that's where energy comes from. But it's a lot of tension. Well, I got that, you know, hugely. In other words, the Jean Jouid talked about are essentially uh, these individuals who roam and range across the four, okay? So that's one of the issues floating around. Again, um, there is, hasn't really been developed that much, and it's been used a lot, but it hasn't really been developed that much, I don't think well, the idea of this Saharan versus Sub-Saharan issue, okay? Which is to say, it, it, it pops up, percolates up in a lot of ways. You have the Arab Union, who's in charge of the Arab Union. Well. Arabs, obviously, but Muammar Gaddafi from Libya loves the Arab Union, okay? And he's essentially Arabic, okay? And often fundamentalist in terms of his Islamic culture, okay? And <coughs> uh, speaks to ethnicity as well in terms of Arabic stuff. Right? And then you have Sub-Saharan Africa, and essentially we'll call it, although it's a, it's a bad, bad way to think about it, or it's, it's not totally correct, black Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, okay? The reality of the matter is everybody in Darfur thinks, uh, speaks Arabic, and everybody in Darfur uh, is Muslim. But that's still floating around in there, okay? It percolates up on occasion. You see it, a point I'll make later, uh, with regard to aid, the Arab Union doesn't want the UN to come in and deal with Darfur. The uh, African Union on the other hand does. Okay, and they essentially read, well, there you go. Okay. The only thing we don't really have going on here too much that you tend to see in African politics all the time is the battle between the French and the English, the Anglophones and the Francophones, which in most countries, there's, uh, in Rwanda, that was a big deal, for example. Right? Those who have been trained uh, in an Anglophone country, like Uganda, for example, in, for lawyers, it's common law versus inquisitorial law, and it's just a difference completely. You don't really see too much of that in Sudan. One of the languages of Sudan, because it was colonized uh, by the British through the Egyptians, is, is English, but uh, <coughs> not a huge cultural battle between the French 
and the, uh, and the English there, okay? The West, again, has a population of 67 million. Of the report of the International Commission of Inquiry on Darfur to the United Nations Secretary General, which was done in 2005, which is a document, if you do Darfur work, constantly look at that document, it's referred to a lot. Um, notes that the various tribes that have been the, uh, this is a quote, the various tribes that have been the object of attacks and killings, chiefly the Fur, Mazalit, and Zagawa tribes, do not appear to make up ethnic groups, distinct from the ethnic group to which persons or militias that attack them belong. They speak the same language, Arabic, and embrace the same religion, Islam. Right? So the ethnic issue, I think is splitting hairs there, but we all know from studying these subjects, issues of ethnicity are definitional problems. I mean, you think sliding scales, okay? Uh, Julie Flint and Eric DeWall and DeFore, A Short History of a Long War, it's a pretty good book on the subject, describe the terrain as follows. I found this pretty interesting. Northern Darfur is a forbidding place. It has landscapes of elemental simplicity, vast sandy plains, jutting mountains and jagged ridges, and occasional ribbons of green along the all too rare seasonal watercourses. A village sometimes compromising no more than a cluster of huts made from straw and branches may be a day's ride from its neighbor. Every place, however humble, counts. A hand dug well in a dry riverbed can be the difference between life and death for a camel herd trekking from the valleys of central Darfur to the desert edge pastures. Nomads move 300 miles or more twice a year, ranging even further in exceptionally wet or unusually dry years. Settled people move also, migrating to open up new areas of farmland in the dry, sandy areas of eastern Darfur, especially villages grow especially. <coughs> villages grow and die with their water supplies and the fertility of their soils. In the far south, along the forest edge, the frontier of cultivation creeps southward Every, every year. Mobility and distance make it difficult to maintain authority. Those in power must always contemplate their objects, their subjects' option of simply moving. <coughs> ironically, <coughs> excuse me, ironically, Sudan, by most indicators, is booming economically. It's got lots of money. Uh, 1999, Sudan began exporting crude oil, and the last quarter of 1999 recorded its first trade surplus. Currently, oil is Sudan's main export, reviving uh, light industry, and with rising oil prices, the Sudanese economy has recorded a growth rate of 7% in 2005. What do we run in the United States? 2.53%? Okay, China runs 10%. They're running 7%. It's huge. The economy is one of the fastest growing in the world. Little of this growth occurs or benefits Darfur. Okay, it's mostly uh, along the Nile River. Right? The numbers are staggering. They get to the point when you do this kind of work where they don't mean anything anymore. It's, it's appalling that that's true. I mean, um, United Nations estimate, uh, estimates that the, the United Nations estimates that the conflict has as many as 450,000 dead since 2003, 450,000 dead as a result of violence, ethnic violence. Nobody really knows, okay? You can get a lot of different numbers. Uh, I looked at all kinds of numbers, and frankly, a lot of them are inflated. A lot of people have um, an interest in inflating the numbers. Right? You need to watch that when you look at the numbers. 450,000 seems to be a given number. Uh, it is used a lot. The United Nations uses it. Right? Uh, perhaps the biggest problem, though, isn't, believe it or not, 450,000 dead people, and we're talking men, women, and children, but rather the two million or so that are displaced, Carol mentioned. And they're not just displaced inside of Darfur anymore. There indeed, there are large camps in Chad now and in uh, the Central African Republic. And what does it mean to be in a camp? It means you walked there, number one. So maybe you walked two, three, four hundred miles with minimal 
food and water, etc. Nobody there to help you, and indeed for many, harassment along the way. It means when you got there, that camp might be well organized and there might be some aid for you if Oxfam's doing their job well, for example. Or it might be a place where a bunch of people stopped going. Now they just stopped moving. That's called a camp. And they set up shacks, uh, huts, and maybe Oxfam or some other agency shows up, start with water, et cetera, et cetera. Now what happens when large numbers of people are all in one place and they just walked 400 miles, 300 miles, 200 miles, whatever, and they haven't eaten much and there are a lot of kids? What happens to them? Huh? Disease, huge, right? Inevitable. You put a bunch of people uh, uh, in the Army, we have a problem in the winter times when we have basic training in the Army. You put a bunch of young men who are healthy together in one place and they all get sick. Okay? We all know uh, those of us who have children, send your kids to school in September, everybody winds up with a cold. Right? The parents wind up with a cold. Imagine what it's like in one of these camps. I mean, this is not a place you want to go. And something else that I saw specifically in the Rwandan camps in the Congo uh, was the issue of security. Nobody talks about this, but what occurs inside the camps is somebody takes over. You know, somebody's got a weapon, they take over. So now they're selling stuff, everything gets bartered. So now you're in the camp, you think you made it to the camp, you don't have malaria yet, that's good. Oxfam showed up and gave you, but Oxfam doesn't have any weapons. There's no police. Chad could care less, right? They want you out of Chad. So some guy wanders down the, the street and, uh, and Chad knocks you over the head and rapes you. Who cares? Nobody in the camp. No security in the camps. And that's usually important, obviously, for the women involved. Frankly, these camps also have issues with regard to pedophiles, little kids. The camps aren't good. You don't want to be in a camp. And you certainly don't want to stay in a camp for long periods of time. So we say they made it to the camp. The reality of the matter is that can be almost worse than the, than the trip to the camp. And this in the face of the fact that the Sudanese government is running a 7% growth rate every year. Okay. Uh, and has, therefore, plenty of money. Unlike many countries, politically, where the, the, the dominant power who's doing the mass killing is really doing it to get everybody's mind off the fact that they can't run the country. Okay. These guys got money, they're not going anywhere. Indeed, they've got sponsors. At the very least, they have China. And uh, we've taken some steps to do something. Certainly we were involved, the United States was involved with the, that portion in South City. We were definitely involved in that, uh, in getting that stopped. But that's coming back, unfortunately. So that's the, the, the politics. Let me attempt to do something here. Let's show you these pictures. Amazing. God, I'm good. <laughs> we'll run through these fairly quick, and, and again, I'm appalled that I would say that about people whose suffering they represent. Uh, the facility with which you can get this information just scares me. It's, it's like an invasion of privacy to me. It's, uh, this is essentially camps, uh, one of the camps. 
Now this is a, uh, an aerial, 2004, an aerial picture of various towns. There's something like 150 sm towns, big a word, uh, small villages that have been destroyed. Essentially, what the Janjaweed do is they ride up on their on their camels or whatever, and they will literally burn everything down, take the men off one place, kill them, send the women walking, or kill the women and the kids. Okay. But what they've essentially done is another word that's come into our parlance since, since Bosnia, ethnic cleansing, okay, right? I find that to be a fascinating modern word, construct as well. Uh, ethnic cleansing is about what? It's about disappearing you from the earth. I don't even need to kill you to ethnically cleanse you. All I need to do is, as in Bosnia, is take all your documents away from you. Take all your ID cards and your driver's license and your mortgage and every other document you have. So that if indeed, and then want and make you go away. So when you come back, you say, that's my house, I want it. Basically. <coughs> Show me your documents. Who are you anyway? Oh, I'm Joe. Sh yeah, prove it. You are a non-person because your documents are gone. Very modern stuff, right? We don't operate without documents. Uh, ethnic cleansing, right? And that's essentially what they're doing here. Although it's not a documents issue as much as it is, uh, we we not only move you, we destroy your property as well. Right? First bunch of, of of photographs deal with the uh, again the conflict. Uh, let's see. Conflict in Darfur is a result of multiple pressures, again, economic, social, cultural, one side of the conflict, again, as we're aware, uh, composed mainly of the Sudanese military and the Janjaweed, a militia group recruited mostly from the Arab Bagara tribes. And then there are revolutionaries who are indeed Darfurians, for, for, of the Fur tribe, F-U-R. Darfur means essentially uh, country of the four, okay? Uh, and that essentially what has occurred is those individuals politically, uh, because they were ostracized and, and, and marginalized completely, uh, really for, since independence 1956 and indeed before that as well, uh, revolted. So we want, to, we, we want to be part of Sudan. Right? And indeed now, given the oil well, oil, et cetera, there's something to be part of, isn't there? Okay, there's, a, there's a benefit to being part of Sudan. Okay. But as we say, this thing started in 2003. The reality of the matter is it's been going on a whole lot longer than that. Okay. We've got young soldiers, child soldiers. I don't know whether any of you were involved in the, uh, or reviewed the, uh, the book by Ismail, last name, yeah. with regard to child soldiers, drugs, etc. Refugee camps. These pictures tend to be the good news stories because they get taken. Mostly they're, they're off a BBC website, but generally they're government pictures, meaning the uh, American government pictures or Doctors Without Borders, some NGO takes the pictures, USAID. Revolutionary soldiers or Darfurians. There has been a, um, I mean, the political facts are kind of irrelevant to this discussion. I won't go into them specifically, but there has been an um, um, a African Union uh, force there, 7,000 troops, unmanned, unfunded, et cetera, et cetera, uh, for the last year or so. Uh, the reality of the matter is, which people don't realize with regard to peacekeeping, and I just pass this on, they have no responsibility for nor are they capable of 
protecting people. Peacekeeping is not peace protecting. Okay? You don't, peacemaking and peacekeeping are two different things. Peacekeeping under the UN mandate as a general rule is a situation like in the Sinai where essentially you put a company of troops in between two parties who want them there and you say to them, uh, if, if anybody breaks the peace, report it to the UN Security Council. Okay, we'll do that. And presently today, some kid from Idaho probably got up in the tower, you know, drinking a Coke, looked around, okay, nobody's doing anything in the Sinai today, and that's what he reported. That's peacekeeping. You don't need weapons. You don't need anything. You can't get hurt. You're not doing any violence to anybody. Okay? So to send these 7,000 guys to Darfur and tell them to do peacekeeping when the government doesn't want them there, and often the, uh, 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 the Darfurians don't want them there either. And then the, the public believes they're not doing their jobs. Well, they're not supposed to be protecting people. Okay? They have no mandate to do that. Indeed, they're not allowed to use their weapons, except in self-defense. Okay? So it's a, it's a fouled up system, to say the least. Future looks like maybe there'll be 20,000 with a bit more uh, uh, robust rules of engagement. But again, are they going to be able to shoot back at, at the Sudanese army? Do we want them shooting back at the Sudanese army? Is the UN going to go to war against Sudan? I don't know. If you're going to do that, then send tanks. Send all the good stuff you need to do to have a war. Otherwise, I don't want to go. Right? Those are tough issues. Uh, very often in the press, we don't, we don't talk about them very much. Some of these pictures are taken by uh, Doctors Without Borders. Uh, of course, is a, uh, a Western construct, an NGO, uh, that works there. Uh, others are, are uh, this is a picture here that demonstrates a guy with a, uh, a bag from uh, Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia released force. And if you don't think there's not a clash of cultures going on with regard to getting uh, credit for that bag of goods with these people, they're missing the point. There's a whole war going on of ideas, if you will, uh, which is a shame because it's certainly not efficient. We tend to see that in the camps. Tough place to soldier. So the just in, in summary with regard to uh, this area, the politics are convoluted, unbelievably complex. They really aren't relevant to what we're talking about that much. The rebels appear to want some participation in the country. The Jean Jouid are supported by the government, which is apparently interested in the ability to dominate the region and manipulate the economic windfall uh, that are the resources. Islamists are looking to dominate non-Arab Muslims. Libya looks to manipulate the domestic politics of resource-rich Sudan. Chad seeks security from Libya and Sudan. And over all of this is an economic and cultural pressure of ever-increasing desertification, which is to say that Sahara Desert's coming south like two feet every year. And when the desert moves south, there's no water, right? So uh, people think of Africa as, a, as, a, as a, a massive jungle. It's very little of Africa's jungle, actually. And that desert's coming south. And this is a classic example of where, it's, where it affects everything, right? <coughs> Alex DeWall kind of uh, sums this up. 
the serial war criminals at the heart of Sudan's present government once sought absolute control in pursuit of an Islamic state. Now they seek power for its own sake. Today, as yesterday, the people they perceive to be challenging that power count for nothing. They can be subjugated, shot, or starved without compunction. If local allies have different axes to grind, they are free to grind them, no matter how much blood they shed. Mass killing has become so routine that it no longer needs conspiracy or deliberation. It is simply how the security elite does business. It is ingrained intent. Interesting term for whether it's genocide, ingrained intent. Atrocity by force of habit. The government and John Jaweed are doing more than destroying groups, whether in whole or in part. They are destroying the very soul of Darfur, which might be another type of proof, it occurs to me, in a trial for genocide, to wipe out, if you will, the culture of a, of a group, an ethnic group. Well, maybe you're indeed wiping out the group, even if they're alive at the end of the day, but they don't know who they are. You've disappeared them as an ethnic group, right? <clears throat> turning neighbors against each other and dismembering limb by limb a society that once thrived in diversity. The shockwaves of this crime, if not reversed, will blight the, life, the lives of future generations, long outlast, uh, outlasting the bloodshed, hunger, and grief of today. The question of the day is, is this genocide? Right. Now, I don't have enough of these. I made 10 copies. Maybe you can share them. For those of you who've never read the Genocide Convention, let me pass these around. Because huh? I'm going to be referring to some of the language. Oh, yes. So thank five more minutes questions. I just want to point out a couple things, and then I will shut up. Um, Genocide Convention is oft quoted, uh, but, but rarely does anybody read it. It's certainly not in our news media. Uh, purportedly, it purports, according to those who use it, uh, to require states to do something when they recognize a genocide. That's why, and even states think there's a problem. That's why people are scared to use the G word, right? But the reality of the matter is, what is the Genocide Convention? It is a treaty between nation states. It's international law, it says right in here, okay? Uh, it's a treaty, so it's a contractual obligation to do only the things that are in the treaty. Okay? <clears throat> it defines what a genocide is, and it also says what you do if indeed you see one, which is essentially nothing. States have no obligation to do anything at all with regard to uh, an observed genocide, nation states. probably a good idea to report it to the Security Council, as if the Security Council in this age of globalization doesn't already know about it. Uh, so no legal responsibility. Uh, what it does do, very quickly, is it defines the term so that at, and it requires states to try people that are, are alleged to be genocide, genocidaire, they okay, say in Rwanda, okay, perpetrators of genocide, to try them in local courts, domestic courts. And indeed, now that we have an international criminal court, you could refer them there as well, which is, of course, what it occurred, what has occurred uh, with regard to the Sudan, Darfur. Okay, there have been a couple of referrals. Okay. So then the prosecutor gets together and says, all right, I want to put this guy in jail for genocide. What do I got to prove? And he says, all right, first thing I got to prove is a, a the following act, it was an act, something actually, not somebody who's thinking about something, it's a, actually did something, committed the following things, and, and the things include killing members of the group, causing serious bodily harm or mental harm, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction, putting them in camps might qualify for that, right? Imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, uh, that's the, the logic of rape, uh, which is, is a genocidal act. It's been found in the Rwandan courts. Is essentially what you're doing is you're disqualifying culturally the woman 
from uh, having an active, normal life, okay, because various cultural considerations now that she's been raped, okay, and secondly, very often the child uh, the, uh, of the rape uh, lineage follows the father. So in Bosnia, for example, you're making little Serbs as opposed to little Muslims, right, by raping the women, the Muslim women, okay. Uh, and forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. Right? So you've got you to be doing one of those things, and it's got to be with the intent to destroy a national, ethnic, or racial, or religious group. That's the kicker. That's where everybody founders, because if you're doing these really, really bad things for other reasons, it's not genocide. Okay? Uh, essentially what those who would like to uh, uh, expand the definition want to do is essentially make genocide seem to me an, uh, a really horrendous category of crime, of a crime against humanity. In other words, genocide would be the worst crime against humanity. Uh, and it could be for political reasons or any other kind of reasons. Okay? So it gets rid of that intent thing. Okay? All right. Um, and that the other arguments for expanding it may come up when we have questions. I don't know. Uh, but I think I will end there, uh, given the above, again, my position. I haven't read anything, or very little. There is a bl there's a black book floating around in Darfur that apparently provides some proof that indeed the government wants to marginalize Darfurians. Uh, I'm not sure I know whether that qualifies as uh, genocide. Yes. Um, that, uh, you said is that the genocide convention doesn't really obligate us to do anything. I mean, nation states. Nation states. Yeah. To do the lawyer. <laughs> um, but you didn't uh, talk about developments, which uh, and. For example, the document on the responsibility to protect, which I, I don't know if it has the same force, force of international law as the Genocide Convention does, but it certainly is a development <coughs> in thinking about the responsibility of nation states to do something. So I wonder, can you comment on that briefly sure. so others can ask other questions as well? <laughs> This issue deals with a real big problem in international law. And the real big problem is the issue of sovereignty. You guys have probably seen this rear its ugly head. But essentially, in international relations, international law, sovereign states under international law get to pretty much do anything they want within their borders. So even Nuremberg. Nuremberg is about punishing, uh, uh, punishing killing the Jews after the war starts outside of Germany. And the tacit international legal conundrum is we couldn't really mess with him messing with his own citizens inside Germany because it wasn't during the war, so it wasn't a war crime. And we didn't have a genocide law then. But uh, Socrates says he gets to do what he wants inside. And there's some good reasons for that. Put them aside. The problem is, of course, that states very often are the ones who do the genocide and do really bad human rights things to their citizens. And they, they're very efficient at it. They've got all the tools and the resources, right? States can be really, very often are, really, governments are really ugly, right? What do you do with that in international law? I mean, and and up, until, up until Kosovo, frankly, international law stood for the proposition that you couldn't do it couldn't enter, they, in other states could not enter your state to stop you from hurting your citizens. Kosovo was the first time the international community got together and said, we're going to stop something that's going on inside your borders, Mr. Washington. Okay? Uh, and essentially, the logic of it is, well, the logic they used in Kosovo was really sloppy. International lawyers were jumping out of windows. Nobody knew what the legal justification was. Nobody. It wasn't one. Just did it. Right? <clears throat> I mean, it's a violation of the UN Charter to do custom for all practical purposes. The logic that they kind of used was 
this is a humanitarian disaster. It's messing with the peace and security of the world because all the casa bars are going to Europe. So therefore, it's spilling over the borders. And, okay? That's what they did. But there is developing in international law this idea that if you're a nation state, <clears throat> you get the privilege of being a nation state, which is to say you get to do things within your borders and nobody gets to mess with you. What do you owe as a nation state? What's your responsibility? Your responsibility is to not do bad things. If you do really bad things, genocide, crimes against humanity, whatever, particularly heinous human rights records, then you forfeited the right to be a nation state. And the international community can then cross your borders and, and throw you out. Okay? That's, that's where we're going. Internationalists are going. What's the problem with that? Nation states got a vote on it. Okay, the 192 at the UN got a vote on it. Well, no nation state wants to say, oh yeah, come on in. I mean, 10 years ago, Mr. Milosevic would have to say, yeah, that's a good idea, let's do it. Right? Is he going to do that? Yeah, yeah. You provided a wealth of information, visual, verbal. Um, I'm going to put a scenario to you, if, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Give me my best shot. OK. <clears throat> Everybody in consensus has said, Richard, we're entrusting you morally, ethically with your judgments. Uh, there needs to be something done. What is your solution? You just mentioned time. What's the problem? You know, this country has to build. You don't have to worry about that. No, no vast amounts of time for diplomats. What, what's your? To this stuff? Yeah. Sudan specifically, but the next Sudan, whenever it might be. How do you? How would you solve? I'm a, a big believer in the United Nations. I think it's broke. And it's, it's on the precipice of disaster. I mean, it's about to fall apart. And if it does, we're really in trouble. I think that the international community needs a vehicle to do these things. The fact that the, the UN can't do this, can't. It's not, everybody wants to blame the United States, but the UN can't do it. They don't have the moral uh, persu uh, persuasion, if you will. Uh, they're, uh, it's real problems. <coughs> right? And it's, we know the UN's made up of nation states. The nation states drag their heels and the UN doesn't go anywhere. We know that as well. But to me, it's the only vehicle. I, mean, I don't necessarily think we automatically need a police force of essentially mercenaries, UN mercenaries, mercs. You know, Blackwater slash UN. And Blackwater is indeed at the present time. You know, that's, a, that's a, uh, essentially the company that works in Iraq. Just got the oh, yeah. thrown out of Iraq. Firing up a bunch of slaves. Cowboys, a lot of cowboys in the black world. Okay. Essentially, a lot of civilians. But they are actually uh, have, have submitted contract uh, bids to do peacekeeping in Africa. And people are thinking about it. And from an international law point of view, our history tells us it's really a bad idea. That's essentially, if you call, uh, your history, Treaty of Westphalia, 1648, is essentially when the nation-state system, that sovereignty was recognized in the national system and the idea, and one of the other things that was done is let's get rid of the mercenaries. We all have our own armies that we can control because mercenaries are worse than the Looney Tunes we hire in our own guys. I trained <coughs> guys in the Ukraine one time. They couldn't wait to be peacekeepers. They wanted to be certified peacekeepers. They, the only army they got is a brigade of peacekeepers. They want to go, so they're available. But the but all that stuff keeps breaking down at the UN for some reason. I'm not sure I know why, but that's got to get fixed, or none of this works. Then we're back to governments. Yes. Question over here. <coughs> yes. Um, I just wanted to go on the um, UN because I have. Little, little louder, please. I have a personal um, issue with. <coughs> And um, I believe the UN is, um, is um, a ticking bomb waiting to explode. And this is as a result, from my own opinion, 
as a result of the um, Security Council, which the United States seems to be part of, um, Britain, China, and all of that. And um, if this, um, these nations who happen to be the um, Security Council, if they happen to be efficient, inefficient, as history has proved, then why or is it, why can't there be, you know, a motivation either, I don't want to say impeachment because it's not a country, the UN is not a country, um, um, a national government, but isn't there a way that this um, Security Council can be dissolved for a new integration of other nations who can, you know, think in an objective manner, because like the the, the Security Council is very, um, I'm very suspicious of them. Like, you know, they have strategies and all of that crap and stuff. So they're not very objective. That's one of it. The second, the second thing I have um, regarding Sudan is that um, why why make laws? That's the UN. Why make laws and then you yourself be the ones to break the laws? For instance, why why talk about interventionism and you know bring two notions, um, strategic and humanitarian? In the case of Rwanda, um, the, 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 the pros and cons were not even weighed, so you know strategy was not in play, and humanitarian reasons were not enough for them to go at. So in this case, I don't know if you know the pros and cons of um, strategy have have been weighed or and as far as I'm concerned in humanitarian I don't think it's good enough but when it comes to strategy I think it's, it's a good enough reason knowing that the um, security council you know wants for money and then oil and stuff like that so I want to know why they're not acting even though you've given me your personal opinion I want to know from you know a bigger a global perspective well uh, you got to remember the United Nations is a, is a a group of nation states, right? It was created after World War II, and it fixed the world in the politics of 1945. So who were the important powers of, the, of in 1945? Frankly, there were only two, but we added a few more, right? Three more, right? And, but at the time, the idea was, and it, it was a, it took the League of Nations, which was the first round of attempting to do collective work, and played around with it and attempted to make it better, okay? Uh, so you wind up with China, uh, or USSR, United States, Britain, and France, okay? Uh, what's happened since, since the 45 or 48 countries that signed the charter uh, showed up since 1945? Well, now you've got 192 countries. All the colonies became countries, countries everywhere. Indeed, since the end of the Cold War, there have been a bunch of new countries. Everybody wants to be their own country, right? which is, is fine. Who am I to say no? Uh, but uh, now you've got a United Nations with 192 using a framework and a set of processes that were created for 50. That's an issue. Who should be in charge of the UN? Should the United States and Russia and China be in charge? What happened to Brazil, Japan, and India? Or maybe you have representatives from all the different continents another approach, right? Sounds good on paper, but at the end of the day, the reality of the matter is the most powerful want the most say in a collective organization. So that's a problem. I think the UN gets fixed or falls apart when the superpowers feel that it's in their personal best interest to have an efficient UN. In other words, if, I, if I'm at the State Department, I say, God, I don't want to go to Sudan. But wouldn't it be great if we went to Sudan and fixed this thing? Let's go call up the UN, send them some money, and work it out. And if the UN was efficient and could deal with that, and then indeed the UN would be, we would support it. So every now and then people would make decisions of the UN that we didn't like. We'd say, it's better that we have the UN than we don't. Okay? And that would be good. But at the end of the day, realists in international relations say that nation states do things for their own national interest only, whether it's Nigeria or the United States. So that 
that's the way the UN operates. And here, we have China on one side with regard to supporting the government of Sudan, because 80% of the oil that comes out of Sudan goes to China, because China's got 10% economic growth, and they need oil worse, worse than we do, and gas. And they're not real interested in sanctions <coughs> and, and beating up on the government of Sudan. Yes? I think part of the problem that, that, that we're having as an audience is with the with the lawyer's side of the zone. And the precise pundit once said, if we always argue whether or not the definition of genocide will be met, while this conch is going around, at the end of the day, the only thing left standing will be the definition. Okay. Yeah, right. And it'll be hundreds of thousands of people that die. And so that I think the tension with the, the people interested in genocide from a scholar perspective, from a humanitarian perspective, or from a civic engagement perspective, is that we feel frustration with the legalistic side of this argument, and that's what you run into in Sarajevo as well. Absolutely. But, and I don't disagree, but my response to that, there's always lawyers, always got a response, right? My response is that we ought to be talking about crimes against humanity. They're unbelievably important. Why do we need to wait for a genocide to go do something? I don't care what this is. This is terrible. Okay. And if we have a moral obligation, we don't have a moral obligation because we use the G word. Okay. Right? We have a moral obligation because it's bad stuff. Okay. We as human beings are pretty responsible. I'm, I'm going to have to step in and say thank you very much. Sure. There's much more that we could um, we could talk about. As you can tell, there a lot of questions weren't answered. More questions raised, uh, Dean Colleen raised the question of the lawyer's view, the scholar's view, the humanitarian view, etc. So there's lots more that can be uh, that can be discussed here. I want to thank you, uh, Professor Richard O'Meara, for uh, being with us this afternoon.